Good morning, I'm Bob Beal, and for the, since 1976 I've been consulting with uh, organizations around the world, approximately 500 of them. I've spent about 5,000 hours one-to-one -one with executives, and about 50,000 hours just with 500 organizations. Some of them have been uh, startup churches or fast-growing churches or large churches. Some have been nonprofit organizations uh, like Campus Crusade for Christ, Focus on the Family, uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom, various uh, large organizations. And I've been a part of working with a lot of corporations, banks, insurance companies, legal firms, furniture companies, and then occasionally a, uh, a government agency. But a lot of what I've done has been with nonprofits that need to raise money. And so what I'd like to teach you now, I'd like to talk to you now about the fundraising process. And it's not necessarily how to raise money as much as it is the process of raising money. And I think it'll become clear over our time together what that means. But the, what I'm going to tell you basically uh, is you can think through raising money in whatever organization you're a part of. It can be startup or it can be two billion a year. You, you have to ask the same basic questions. It's a scalable tool that will help you regardless of the size of your organization. You basically start uh, with the fundraising process with defining ministry. If you don't have a ministry, why are you raising money? If you don't want to start a ministry, why are you raising money? And so you start with the ministry itself. But I'd like to take a, a brief break right here and introduce you to a tool that I've just been working on. And by the way, if you'll, if you, uh, Cheryl's going to send around an email, uh, a sheet. And if you'd like to get sort of my real notes on it, uh, just put your email right clearly, if you will, and we'll be glad to send you a copy of the, these eight points I'm going to make. And we'll be happy to send you also a quick wisdom, which is free, and two or three times a month, I'll send you the latest question I'm asking or principle I'm teaching or something like that, just to let us keep in touch over the years. But I'd like to show you uh, a concept I'm working with that deals with where is your ministry at this point? Where are those three ministries? in the process of becoming a movement. There are eight steps I've identified in the process of becoming a movement. Because a lot of us say we would like to create a movement in our country. We would like to create a movement, our church to become a movement, etc. The first step in creating a movement is target market. In other words, who is it that you're really trying to reach in that ministry you've got? And if you say, we're trying to reach everyone, don't go raising money with that approach. But say, who is our target market? The second thing is thoughts organized. In other words, you may, you may have tons of research data and lecture notes and books and tapes and you may have, it may be all floating around in your mind as to what we're going to do with this target market. But you need to organize that into some kind of a realistic organized uh, format. Then thirdly, and this is meant to, by the way, these eight steps are meant to show you where are we in the process of developing this particular ministry. Whether it's your church, whether it's a program you've got that you think is spreadable to the world, whatever it is you're developing, this is meant to help you see where are we actually. The third is a theory. And the, the theory says, if we do this, then here will be the result. If we do this with youth, then this should be the result that happens. This is what should happen as a result uh, uh, of doing what we're planning to do. 
Step four is the point at which most ministries, I think, make the biggest single mistake in their fundraising process. It's the myth stage. And this is basically saying it's confusing activity with results. It's saying, oh, it's, it's working, it's, it's doing great. We've got 80 staff already in 18 campuses, and, and we've got offices in 10 villages, and we've got, and all this. And I say, what results are you seeing? Oh, we've got a two, year, two million euro budget, and we've got, we've got uh, uh, every, all of them have uh, iPads, and, and our staff is fully equipped. But what results are you seeing? And there are no results. They say, yeah, but this thing really works. I say, could you take me to one campus where it's actually working? Well, we're working on that, but this is, this is a phenomenal idea. You're, you're trying to sell a myth. You're trying to raise money, but it's a myth. That's a kind word for it's a lie. It isn't real yet. The fifth step is where you have a prototype. A prototype is something that works with one leader in one location. In other words, you may have something that really works. You say, if then, that'll be the result. And at your campus, it does work. You're there, it works. I, I ask you, could you take me to a campus where it's working? Sure, come and see mine. It works. And it works at 80 campuses and everything. I say, could you take me to a second one? Well, we're working on that. We've got a budget of 2 million euros. Could you take me to a second campus where it's working? Well, no. But we're on 80 campuses. I say, no, you've got a prototype. You don't have a model. It's way too soon to be rolling it out. It's way too soon to be putting a lot of money into this model because it isn't a model, it's a prototype. It works in one place with one leader, but maybe the only reason it's working is because of you as the charismatic leader. The only reason it's working is because you are there or because you happened on to a location where it's a phenomenal location, but you put it in any other location, it won't work. Then you move, number six, is to a model. A model is something that's working with three different leaders in three different locations. You say, oh, this really works on this campus. Let's put it on 10 campuses around Europe. I say, hold on, hold on, time out. Don't waste your money because it may not work on nine other campuses. And you've wasted a lot of time, energy, money. Make it work on a second campus first. You may try it on a second campus 30 kilometers away. It doesn't work at all because you're not there personally. And you may have chosen a location that isn't the right location. It isn't transferable yet. But when you say, it works on two locations, I, I can take it to two campuses. I say, great, let's put it on a third. And if it works on all three campuses with three very different leaders, then we're ready to talk about 10 around Europe. And then when 10 work, we're ready to talk about 30. But don't get it working in one place and talk about 10 or 30. Then, number seven, is organization. What kind of an organization do we need to support the model we're building? And then number eight is movement. In other words, a movement is something that's growing just faster than we have ability to control. By the way, I asked Bill Bright one day, I said, Bill, what is the key to controlling a movement? He said two things, your literature and your training. If you are about ready to explode something around the world or around your nation or around Europe, control your literature and control your training.
I'm going to pause here. Does this make sense to you? I can't read your minds. I need to see your heads now. Does it make sense to you? Okay. So if I'm a donor and I've got 100,000 euros to give you, I can give it to you here if you say, Bob, we've got a target market, but we need to develop our thinking here. I say, okay, I'll give you some money to take three months aside to do that. Or if you're here and you say, we're here, we need some money to develop a theory. I say, that makes sense. And if you're here and say, we'd like to build a prototype of what we think will work, I say, great, I'll fund that. If you say, we've got one of them going, but we'd like to prove it in three locations, that's great. If you say, we've got it in three locations, but we need some money to start an organization that, to support those models, that's great. If you say, we've got an organization that's becoming a movement, that's wonderful. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Do not pretend that, you're, that everything is working perfectly well because you've got 80 people running around campuses, spending money, doing things with no results, and ask me to support that. Don't ask me to support a lie. Don't ask me to support a myth. Don't ask me to support something that you say, yeah, we've got all this activity going, all this activity, but we don't have any results yet. That's, that's the main message here. So what I'm saying is, with your ministry, make sure that you've got the right three ministries, or maybe one ministry, but make sure that it's actually a model, or make sure that you understand where you are in that process. And then make sure that you've got, in terms of organization, that you've got, what are the three things we need to do to service any donations properly to get them to the ministry in less than 90 days? Because some organizations, you, they get a big check in, 10,000 euro check, and it sits there for 90 days because there's no one to process it. And then you look at resources. Where are our top three sources of resource? Is it large donors, small donors, foundations, corporations, uh, 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 entry fees? Where does our resource come from? And then have we got a process that will take it to here and to here and then feedback in, in some way, a written report, a computer report, a something, a, a receipt stuffer report, something that says, here's, you, you gave this money in a very timely way and in a way you can trust. We processed the money to get it to the ministry. Here's the ministry that happened. Here are the receipts administration. We had the ministry. Here are the receipts. Everything was handled properly. And donor, you gave us the money. Here's the result. You need to have all three of these, or I'm sorry, all four in place because every organization will, will shrink to the size of the smallest box. Let's say, for example, you say, well, we don't need a lot of feedback because when we ask people for money, they know it's going to happen to minister. You know what? If you never feed back to people, what's going to happen? If this isn't here, people are going to stop giving. And then you don't need all these people, and your ministry will go back to here. It all reverts to the smallest box. And if you've got a lot of money coming in, a lot of organization, but no ministry, you've got nothing to feed back, so this will shrink. This will have to fire these people. The ministry, it all reverts to the smallest box. So you've got to keep those four things clearly in place to keep it going. Now, it, with resources, you say, how do we start? Where do we start getting resources uh, in terms of, uh, it, it's just like, it, it, we just don't have enough money. I say, start with the dry leaves. There's a, start with a, a list of dry leaves and, and grow it. Uh, you've heard the, the old Boy Scout uh, or Girl Scout uh, story of, if you're in a woods that's been raining for two weeks, 
or for two days or something, and you're, you're nearly exhausted, you're cold, you're shivering, etc. And you need to start a fire. And you've got a canister with one match left. Don't try to start an old, heavy, wet log. Roll over a log, find some dry leaves, put some damp twigs on it, some damp branches on that, and pretty soon you've got a roaring fire that will hold even a wet log and dry it out. I'm saying start with the people that are most excited about what you're doing and, and take them to your ministry. Show them your ministry. Show them the campus where it's actually working. Have them come to the church where it's actually working with the youth or whatever you're raising money for. Get them really excited and ask them to get other people excited. Now, there are two ways of looking at donors, too. One is, I have to go out and find people that are not interested, could care less, uh, don't know anything about my ministry, and I have to get them excited. That's one assumption you're making as you're raising money. The other one is, somewhere there are a lot of people that would like to see done what we're doing. I say, reach the youth of Poland. In America and other places, other nations, there are people who are Polish descent or, or care about the people of Poland or care about Poland in general. They would like to see the youth of Poland reach, reach for Christ. All I have to do is find out where they are and who they are and keep telling them the results we're seeing and they will want to give money to support us. I believe in this model the most. And again, nothing motivates like results. You have to keep showing the results here, not just the activity. When you keep showing the activity, it tires people out. I'm tired of hearing how active you are, how many hours you're working, how tired you are. All I want to know is what are the results you're seeing? I don't care how many offices you've got open, how many people are coming to Christ, how many people are being discipled, how many students are you graduating, how many people are attending the church, etc. I want to see results if I'm going to give money. And basically, another thing you want to understand in a church or a nonprofit is that you aren't just trying to break even each year. You're trying to actually be profitable. The only difference between a nonprofit organization and a for-profit organization is what, you, what do you do with the money that's left over? Because both are trying to raise more money or earn more money than they spend so they've got money, and a for-profit takes that money and buys a Bugatti or buys a Maserati or buys a Ferrari for their children or something, whereas the nonprofit takes the money that's more than they, more than they needed and puts it into growing the organization in the future. The other difference is that when you build a for-profit company, when you die or leave, you can give it to your children or your estate or sell it in a nonprofit. You leave it to the board and you walk out or you die or something, the board takes it on. You don't take it with you. That's the main difference between a nonprofit and a for profit. But but your ministry is a combination of business and ministry. You need to understand that. Because you, uh, Ted Engstrom, who was a president of World Vision for a number of years or you know, involved there, said it's a combination of business and ministry. If you don't think it is, don't pay your bills and see how long your ministry is in existence. On the other hand, if you pay all your bills but you have no ministry, you have no ministry. It's just a business. It's a combination of both. You want to see it that way. And a lot of people would like to help you if they knew about the results you're seeing. Questions? In terms of building a team, if you had to choose between a person that was experienced and available but not very excited about what you're doing and a young person who may not have the experience or the credibility but they were very excited about what you're doing, which one would you choose? I'd probably go with the person that was uh, excited about what I was doing because you can teach them. But you, it's, I'd probably spend time trying to excite the person with the experience uh, by showing them the results we're, going, we're seeing, take them to the event, show them the experience, let them become involved in it. And if they still aren't, aren't really interested in it, uh, I wouldn't hire them. And if the young person seemed teachable, 
they may not have experience, but if they're teachable, I try to teach them something and see how teachable they seem. But if they're excited but not teachable, I wouldn't hire them either. I just keep looking for both of them. I just set both of them aside. But if the young person is teachable, then that's the person I would go with. Okay. The question is, uh, what if the ministry is having trouble right now? How do you feed back? A lot of people, 80% of the people you'll ever meet, are problem solvers. So I would report whatever positive ministry I could report here. And I'd say, but we do have problems we're working on. And so please pray with us that we'll be able to get these problems uh, dealt with. And someone here may say, that's my specialty. Let me come and help you with that problem. So I wouldn't hide the fact that we got problems. It doesn't have to all be positive, but it is all things that we're experiencing on the way to getting the results that you want to see.